Now, one approach that you can use in your teaching are excursions and incursions. Now, these offer the ability to take your students to off-site locations where they can engage, say, with a computing company or go to a museum or um, to a convention um, showcasing technologies, various approaches like that. Um, I used to take students to Movie World and Dream World, where we had access to behind the scenes um, uses of the technologies in movie making and in the IT systems at Dream World. So there are various um, opportunities to take your students to various locations and companies and organizations so that they can gain access to learning that may not necessarily be available on campus. Now, we also have virtual excursions nowadays um, and there's other ways of doing some of these things which can make it easier. Now, of course, the biggest impediment around excursions is gaining permission to take your students on the excursion. There also can sometimes be costs involved, particularly around transport. So these are things you need to consider and whether or not that cost is borne by the school or by the students and their parents um, and what implications that has around equity, um, whether or not all the students will be able to attend those excursions. So you need to think through those things. There's also a certain level of risk involved in conducting an excursion. You're taking students off campus. Now, on a, in a, within a school, we've got a well-established processes and policies to keep students safe. Um, outside of the school grounds, that becomes a little bit more problematic. Not exceptionally so, but there are certain things that need to be thought through so that you have considered all of the different issues and generally your school will have some sort of excursion policy and processes that you'll need to go through and fill in forms and gain permission to be able to conduct an excursion. Now you'll generally also have to gain the permission of parents uh, so that they agree to the excursion occurring. Um, again, because it's an out of ordinary thing that's going to happen, but it's not an exceptionally difficult thing to achieve. Now, probably the biggest issue around excursions is that they really can be contained within your single lesson time. Uh, and they'll often go for half a day, or potentially a full day, which will have an impact upon other teachers and students learning in other programs. Now, that said, it's generally accepted that excursions provide a benefit to students learning. So having some excursions during a school year is normally okay. But if you are doing them too much, then that would have too big an adverse effect on other teachers and on the students' um, learning opportunities. So they have to be considered in balance. And your deputies and your principal will keep track of that when you apply for excursions. So think about how you could utilize excursions in the teaching of digital technologies and what opportunities might exist to enhance what students are learning by actually being able to physically go somewhere and engage with um, the opportunities that exist in that. Now, the other approach is incursions. This is where you bring outside expertise, be it a company or an individual, into the school to engage in, with an educational opportunity with your students. So it might be, there are various groups that run robotics programs. So you might not have the robotics equipment yourself in the school, but you employ the um, robotics, um, what we call them, <laughs> um, expert. They'll come into the school and they'll run a robotics program with your students. It might be for half a day, it might be for a full day, and students will gain that experience through that process. Now, these experts are available in a whole range of areas. Um, might be cybersecurity, might be various specific aspects of computing and programming. So you can think about the opportunities that this provides. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a paid expert though. It could be um, one of your students' parents that work in the IT industry. It may be the local council and having 
um, some experts come in from that. It might be from a local IT company. So there's lots of opportunities to bring staff or to bring people into the school environment to conduct the professional development there. There are still, however, restrictions and policies that need to go in place. Um, generally in Queensland, we have what's called the blue card system, which is a way of um, determining whether or not someone has had a police check and are safe to work with children. And in the main, we would try to um, require people to have a blue card if they're coming onto a school grounds and interacting with students. Now, there are some exceptions to that, but that's the general um, process. So that's sort of like a minimum expectation. You'll still need to supervise what's happening because they are not necessarily teachers. So there still needs to be some mechanism to manage the processes involved and to ensure everything goes well. So the other problem with that is sometimes there's um, some costs involved, particularly with their paid groups that come in to do incursions. But there can also be lots of benefits from doing so. So again, go through the course notes and you'll see the various positives and negatives for both excursions and incursions. Now with all of this, there'll generally be again a requirement to gain student and parent consent. Student consent is normally fairly easy. Parental consent involves uh, a form going home or an email or some sort of mechanism to have parents give their consent for this to occur. Again, because it's out of the ordinary, it's not an, a normal part of the expectations of what they have with students going to school. Sometimes these consents are gained at the beginning of the school year and there's sort of a blanket consent given, particularly when these things are well planned in advance, sometimes years in advance, but in the main, there still needs to be some processes that go through. And you need to think about what happens if uh, consent isn't given. Um, generally, the student needs to be supervised in some way with another class or um, in the office, whatever has to happen to still enable them to have an educational experience, but not the experience that's been happening with the excursion or incursion. Now, this sort of leads into another right that students have, which is to privacy. Um, it's not a thing we do well in schools. We're quite good in uh, protecting students' privacy from outside forces, such as uh, people taking photos of students um, at the school and, and things of that nature. But less enforced is how we treat students' privacy um, ourselves. Now, generally in Australia, we don't take photos of students. Um, mostly it has to do with uh, an idea of um, uh, separated parents um, where some parents don't know where their children are attending school and sharing photos on social media, for example, may allow them to identify what school they're at and, and things of that nature relatively rare instances, but it has built up a culture in Australia whereby photographs of students are discouraged, um, certainly of their faces. And that's generally been applied as a general right of privacy, not to take photographs of students' faces that, where they could be identified, unless express permission is given and used in school newsletters and things like that. It's not the case overseas. Um, and I've taken a number of study tours overseas with um, teachers and from Australia and we've been constantly surprised at how easy it is for people for us to take photos of students in, in schools whereas in Australia the culture is very much that that doesn't happen. Now we're less um, stringent on other aspects of student privacy. We're very stringent if, if the information is going beyond the school um, but in terms of how we treat our own collections of information about students, be it assessment information or um, essays or things that students have created, um, we're rather lax in terms of privacy. Now that's likely going to change 
particularly as privacy laws are increasing in the European Union and that's sort of slowly percolating down into a greater recognition that students have uh, rights, just as anyone else has rights in our society, to their privacy. Um, but there is a balance around that. Um, we do take a responsibility for ensuring students are protected and are safe at school. So there are certain rights, as parents have certain rights, to infringe upon students' privacy to ensure their safety and, and things of that nature. But increasingly it's been identified that that has to be an explicit um, potential threat. It can't just be a general um, culture whereby we automatically um, override students' rights, um, such as the right to have a private conversation or to um, various things where in adult society, we take them for granted that in a school environment, we uh, override those rights as a matter of course. So think about some of the rights that um, you would expect still to give to your students. Um, do they have the right not to give their name? Generally not. We override that every single day, every single lesson. Um, we require them to give their name and to identify themselves as part of the role marking process. And there are many, many cases whereby we infringe upon those rights. Um, but there is still the educational need to do so in some cases, or at least make an argument to do so. And again, we'll discuss these in the tutorial.